uh, reading an article this past week uh, by a columnist by the name of David Brooks. And he says that we're living in the middle of a religious revival. Uh, but it's not what we normally call religion. He says the first rising movement is that uh, of astrology. According to a 2018 Pew poll, which is fairly reputable, 29% of Americans say they believe in astrology. That's more than our members of mainline Protestant churches. He says uh, online horoscope sites are booming. Uh, they get so much more traffic these days than they did even just a few years ago. So another surging spiritual movement is witchcraft. In 1990, only 8,000 Americans self-identified as Wiccans. Ten years later, there's 134,000. Today, there are over a million who identify in witchcraft. Wicca, by that in estimation, is technically the fastest growing religion in America. And there are other religious type of movements going on. It says during the uh, Brett Kavanaugh hearings, 13,000 resistant witches cast a hoax, or a hoax, a hex. <laughs> That's my mistake. Cast a hex on, <laughs> on, on Brett Kavanaugh. Like, didn't know that was going on. Uh, it, it's, it's people's way of trying to make sense of life or trying to move things the way they should. Or if we know what's going on, we can, we can avoid that, or we know what to expect, we can better deal with that, or somehow we can control the cosmos, or whoever, or whatever, making things happen, well, uh, it can go more how we think it should go. It says, though, the biggest uh, thing from all these rising religions is that society is groaning, and I think we can all agree about that. Society is groaning. Uh, people are hurting. And we don't know where to turn. Maybe we've turned to the church, and the church has left us empty, and so now we're, we're going to other places, trying to make sense of it all. And I think we all have to make sense of, of life, and why do some things happen? And, and have this, what's called a, a world view. Why do certain things happen to you, or this country, or the ones you love, and, and maybe not other things? Is there a cause? Is there an effect? Can we connect the dots somehow? And as we try to think through this, uh, uh, I invite you, don't leave God out. And so we've been talking about God's sovereignty here lately. In fact, when, when Mike preached last week, I, I thought he said that Jonathan Edwards preached 14 years on the sovereignty of God. And I, I was sitting back there, and I thought, I don't know if I heard that right, so I came up and I asked him, like, like they had 14 years? Yeah, they had 14 years. And that, that's a long series. And I don't know if people uh, have the capacity to sit still long enough to hear 14 years to do the math. That's a lot of sermons <coughs> on the sovereignty of God. Sometimes these days they say, well, do a series of maybe four, no, long, no longer than six, because people get bored and you have to go on to something else. I go, really, we get bored with, it's, it's that quick we have to go on to another topic because we've heard that one, now we're going in and do something different, Pastor, or we're going to fall asleep and you're not going to like that. But include God, God's sovereignty, in thinking through why and how things happen. And so we've defined it, and today I want to talk about God's sovereignty and Satan, which is uh, interesting, uh, I think. Uh, if the church makes a mistake when it comes to Satan, either we think too much about him, and everything that, that goes on that we don't like is attributed to Satan. You know, if there's a buzz in the sound system, there he is, messing up our worship, if the lights go out, there it is, go down in power lines. If the grass isn't cut, uh, if your car won't start, a demon's in your engine block, you know, we need to cast him out, and it just gets nuts sometimes. But the other mistake is not to acknowledge him at all. Nah, maybe he's over in some far, far third world country, you know, 
doing his work, but not, not here in scientific America. And that would be wrong as well. Now, God's sovereignty, uh, we define it, it means that God's in control. And here's another definition. Nothing takes place in this life which does not go through his hands, and he is supreme over everything. Now, you can do a lot of work on what do you mean by what goes through his hands. And we're going to do a little bit of that today. But nothing, nothing, nothing goes on. See, nothing is the first word, and everything is the last word. Those are a nice bookends. Nothing takes place in his life which does not go through his hands. At the very least, he does not allow or his permissive will, and he is supreme over everything. To God, there are no mistakes. To God, there are no accidents. He knows it's coming. He could have prevented it, but they happen anyway. That means he's supreme over every occurrence that happens in this life, in your life, and in this world. So everything which takes place will either be promoted, permitted, or prevented by the, sovereign, or the Father's sovereign will. Again, promoted, permitted, or prevented by Almighty God's sovereign will. And so, again, yeah, this morning, God's sovereignty, Satan, and how those two intersect. Now, first thing, and, and you know this, and that is Satan is on safari. He's, uh, he's up to something. He's not silent. He's not static. He's on the move, and he has an agenda. A lot of you are familiar with this verse. It says, be of sober spirit, be on the alert, because your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. That's exactly what he's doing. He's doing it today, and he wants to devour like you and me and everyone. That's the agenda. He wants to destroy your character. He wants to destroy your soul and your spirit. That's what he's after. But he wants, he wants to do it without you knowing he has done it. That's where he's like sneaky. Doing it in the dark or without us being aware. He wants you to believe you're doing just fine. But you're not. He wants you to think that any problems you have are the problems of other people spilling onto you. Or it's the happenings of, of the military or government or, or different things and, and it's just kind of happening to you that you don't so much have a problem, but other people do, if only they would give you space. His, his desire is to devour your spirit and your soul so that you are little more than a shell or a body. He wants to take away the enthusiasm from your life. Why is it that for so many people, the older they get, the less they laugh, the less joy they have, the less, the less energy, the less what I call internal energy, the less enthusiasm that's in their soul. What is it that the younger people seem to have what we really want these days? We can talk about, well, they're, they're just young. They, they'll see. They, they can't figure this out yet, but one day, you know, to be more than Christians, you talk a good Jesus, but essentially know little of the God of which we speak. Um, we want to make Jesus more than a theory. There are some Christians, they, they live what's called a functional atheism. Meaning, yet, yeah, it's not that they would deny God, but they live as though God doesn't really exist. I go being lulled to sleep by way of the never-ending Bible study. Now, I'm not against Bible study, but some folks, they're, they're in continual Bible study, but it seems like nothing really changes. I think the thought is that if you get more information, by way of information, there'll be transformation. You need information for transformation, but information enough is insufficient. And so, don't get caught up in just thinking that if I just keep studying, something, something's going to click sometime. This, this call of, of being aware, of being on the alert, is to, is to wake up, to pay attention, sit up straight, 
You know, stop being distracted. Put the Bible into practice. It takes effort. It takes attention. It takes time. And I say this, I go, to know what to do, but not to do what you know, is worse than not, not know at all. It's one thing to act because I didn't know any better, but, but if you know better, but still don't do it, though, to me, that's worse yet. We're, we're accountable. Just, just know that Satan is on mission, and his mission is to destroy. It's always been like that. Always. A number of years ago, um, I, you know, I spent time in Wisconsin. I started this church in Wisconsin. And there was a guy who uh, came a few times and he, 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 wanted, he wanted to give to me stuff to give to kids. Oh, I got all, I got all this candy. And, and you give it to the kids. And, and I have other things. If you need some office furniture, well, I, I have things like, he had this big warehouse. He's talking about all this stuff and he, he gave it away. And he, he was wanting to have prayer meetings. So at where, where he worked, and have pastors come in. And, and the assistant DA came and talked to me one day. We, we played basketball together. And he says, uh, is so-and-so coming to your church? You go, yeah. He go, be careful of him. Why is that? It's because he's the most evil man I've ever met. Why state that from this assistant district attorney? I says, you're going to have to fill me in. He says, well, probably, uh, probably one of the biggest drug dealers in the county. He says, Rick, you know, normally people uh, deal drugs for two reasons. Number one is, is to, to make money, make a lot of money. Number two, to supplement their, their own drug habit. He goes, the guy isn't in the money and he doesn't use drugs himself. Oh, why does he do drugs? Why does he sell drugs? He says, the only reason he sells drugs is to destroy people's lives. That's why he's the most wicked man, the most evil person I have ever met. You be careful with him. I stopped taking candy. He stopped coming to church. I think we were much better for that. Beware those that come under false pretense. Beware of what, the wolves in sheep's clothing. Why, they look harmless, but they're not. It's not to be suspicious of everyone that walks in the door of your church, but just, just understand there are some that you know, sing the song, say the prayer, Maybe don't fall asleep during the sermon, but it doesn't mean that they're walking with God. I, I still believe that some of the most evil people go to church on Sunday. I'm not talking about you, all please. Is he talking about me? Is he thinking about me? I'm not talking about you, really. Let me be one in the back. Uh, no, 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 I'm not. I'm not. Um, now, please understand this, though, that even is active, that Satan is, that Satan is under God's control. There is a spiritual battle going on. You have to understand that. But it's not that like we're sitting here, it's, it's not like God saying we're having a, a, an arm wrestling contest and God's going, oh, it's nothing like that. All that has to do is this, and Satan will go, whoa, whoa. He's under God's control. There's the most interesting conversation in Job 1 between God and Satan, or some calls the, the Satan, the adversary. And in that conversation, God, seemingly from nowhere, says this, Have you considered my servant Job? If Job was aware of this conversation, he said, God, shh, 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 don't bring me up. Talk about Bob down there. He, he's much better than me. No, no. Have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him on the earth. He's blameless, he's upright, he fears me, and he turns away from evil. That's how great he is. Satan replies this, yeah, but you want to know why? I tell you why he's like that, because you've given him everything. If, if you stop giving him stuff, should life get tough, then Job will turn his back on you, God. He will surely curse thee to thy face. That's what Satan says. 
Huh. Okay. Well, then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only don't put forth your hand on him. That is, you can do whatever you want to what I have given him, but don't take his life or, or give him a disease or some infirmity. Don't put your hand on, on his physical being, but everything else, um, Satan, you can do as you see fit. So Satan departed to go basically mess up Job's life. Mm -hmm. Something to understand here, and that is you see that until then, Satan did not have God's permission to mess up Job's life. When he says, all that he has is now in your power, there's been a shift and a transfer. Before God says, you know what, I am the one here, but now let me, but even then you can't do this. You can do that, but you can't do this. That's what's happening here. See, now understand Satan is not sovereign like God. He's not omniscient. Satan doesn't know everything. He doesn't know what you're thinking. You know, oh, you know, he doesn't know that. He may have a good idea, but he doesn't know that. I don't know what you're thinking. I think I may have an idea with some people, but I don't know, no. He's not om omnipotent. He does not have all power. Now, he has power. He doesn't have all power. He's not omnipresent, so Satan cannot be in more than one place at a time. He can't both be here and there. He's got to pick one. He's not messing personally with everybody all at once. He can't do that. God can hear everyone's prayer all at the same time and deal accordingly to every single one of them. See, he can't do that. Just to be so glad in God's sovereign, but he's not. So see, God has put up a, 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 a limitation on what he can do. Um, it's not that he can't do anything. He can do a lot, but he can't do anything without God's permission, God's permissive will. And now the question is, well, why does God give him permission to do anything? Why did God just shut him completely down? Listen, he will someday, but not yet. Revelation 20, yes he will, but not yet. And so we groan, right? The earth groans until that day. Why does God give him permission at all? I just say, for God's glory and for the greater good of which sometimes we just don't understand. For God's glory and for the greater good. So Satan goes to work. And Job had a lot of stuff. And Satan used some men and had all of Job's livestock wiped out. He was a wealthy man. He had all of Job's servants killed. Didn't stop there. The messenger came to Job and said, that's not all. Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in your oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they died. How many children did Job have? Ten. Seven boys, three girls. And they're all gone. Now I know that uh, in this church, and you know some people outside the church who, who have lost a, a child. And uh, the, the pain is horrific. And I know that some of us, if we live long enough, we may lose maybe another child or two. And, and, and it's horrible. There, but here, here's Job and lost them all at once. And it says here, it says, they were young people. We had a great time Friday, Daniel, Mary gets his wedding. 
Yeah, Mary Gold now it was Mary X. Yes. Thanks for the correction, Mary Sister. Oh <laughs> um, yeah, we had a great time. And and I get there, we had the rehearsal Thursday, and I said this when I get there, I go, you all look so young. And so you got probably like Father Time, don't I? He's an old man. You may go, the boys got maybe a couple more servants left, or we're gonna have to get a ramp for him pretty soon. Go karts and a couple battery packs on the end, and he'll forget what he's saying in the middle of the sermon. He'll preach the same sermon next week too, because he'll forget, you know, uh, you know, one day. But if they're in there, they look so young. It's one thing for someone like my age or older to, to die. He said, well, you know what? He lived a good life. He had, he had enough food. He used up enough oxygen. And yeah, he, he could go. But, but for a young, they're just getting started. And I'll tell you, I haven't had to do it very often, but the hardest thing I've ever had to do as a pastor is to do a funeral for an infant. And you walk in the air and the casket's like this big. And I get that. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can keep it together long enough. I don't know if I'm going to be able to, to say any words without me just slobber all over the place. And of course you know the people are going to, they're just going to be crying. The, the younger, the younger the person, the more their tears that, that I found out. And so I, I was, I was going through my, my manual for the wedding. It's also a manual I use for funerals. Uh, and so there's a couple different sections. And I pulled out an old funeral I did back in 2002. And it was a, a young lady, about 20 years old, that had, had died in a car accident. And uh, it was so horrific. When uh, they allowed the mom to, to see the body, all they allowed her to see was her right arm. And I remember at, at that funeral, we're doing the grave side. And uh, I'm done talking, and they're ready to put the casket in the ground. Mom throws herself on top of the casket. And just, have you ever heard the wailing? It runs chills up and down your spine. That was her way. That was her grief. And literally, two or three guys uh, had to go and, and, and remove her from the casket. And you go, oh, my, oh, my. Now, oh, God spare me from ever experiencing that kind of grief. But here's Job. Seven sons. Three daughters, all at once. I can't imagine it. Well, what's the what? Why? Well, verse 19 says this great wind came from across the waters. Well, that may be a tornado. And so it was the weather. Mother Nature. Just just doing her thing, and and, and that's why. That's what it looks like. That's what some would conclude, but we know. Since we read that we have the story in front of us, we know that uh, actually it was it was the adversary who was able to cause this great wind because God had given permission to destroy this structure and fall upon the young people and that they all died. But see, we know even more than that. We know you gotta work it back. It's not just the weather. It's the weather, it's more than the weather. We know it's more than whether it's also the adversary, but we're going back to the We know it's God who gave the adversary the power and the permission to cause the, the wind to happen and for the roof to cave in and for the structure to go down and fall upon the young people. So we trace it back to its source. We're like, that's horrible, but yes it is. So we had this incredible time, Thursday and Friday, celebration. Man, it was great. And, and a lot of people in the church, you know, they're there. You know what's happening tomorrow here? Funeral. For a 15-year-old boy. Having viewing the, the high school today, we'll have some viewing here, the funeral happens here tomorrow. 
course, if you're a parent, what's that about? What's going on? Why, right? Why? Trying to connect some dots, make some sense, get some comfort. When, when calamity and grief enter into your world, and for many of us it has, if it hasn't yet, I don't want to ruin your day, young folks, but one day it will. Please remember Job's response to the worst possible thing that could ever happen to us. Job's response. This is what he did. It said that Job arose and tore his robe and shaved. That doesn't mean we have to tear our clothes or shave our, our head. It's symbolic, but what it means is the tearing of the robe means inner turmoil and shock. Grief. I would guess that he, he wailed loudly. He cried until he couldn't cry anymore. That's that's a, pro that's a process, that's an important part of loss. He shaved his head symbolizing the loss of his glory or his personal glory. My children in some way contribute to my glory, now they're all gone. Part of my glory is gone. So I'm tearing my clothes, I'm shaving my head, I am in grief, I am in mourning, my children are gone, part of my glory is gone. In times of grief, or in times of loss, we need to grieve. We need to. That's not all I did, though. And I would say, don't stop at grief. Grieve, but, but please add more to it. And it says that God says, and, and Job, he fell to the ground and worshipped. That might seem odd. Many worshipped. You can grieve and worship the same time. And in fact, worship is, a, is an important part of, of grieving. You, you don't want to just grieve or that's all you'll ever do. It's important to turn Godward. I think we've all met people who uh, horrible things happen to them or a loved one and next thing you know, they're, they're, they are angry and they uh, maybe are cursing God. If that's the way the God in the Bible, if that's the way a loving God's going to be, I don't want to have anything to do with the God like that. I am done with church. I am done with scripture. I am done with Christianity. I am out of here. We heard of a man named uh, Ted Turner. Did the. Uh, TBS <coughs> Broadcasting, TV, whatever, Mary Jane Bond, some of you Ted Turner. And Ted Turner's an atheist. Did you know that when Ted Turner was young, he wanted to be a missionary? Until he saw his aunt go through a long, long cancerous illness and one day die. And he included That's the way God should have been. I don't want anything to do with them. That's where some people go. Don't do that. Grieve with worship. And this is what was going on in, in Job's mind. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I'll, I'll go back there. And then he says, The Lord came, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. See, Job knew that all that he had had come from God. I'm not saying he didn't work hard and he was a good business person and he was an upright man, he was fair and honest. Uh, and so he, he had so he was a rich man, but he had he had family. And his family was important to him, but God was Job knew that he, all that he had God had given to him. And just because God had given it to him didn't mean that now Job it was his. It was still God's. He understood stewardship. That everything belongs to God. It's strictly on loan to us. 
And for parents to understand, we love our kids, they are on loan. And so, if God gives, and there's still gods, God, whenever he sees fit, can also remove them from my presence. It's his right. And then it says, blessed be the name of the Lord. Let me say this, and I think this is important. If we do not connect our laws to God's sovereignty, sovereignty, we may endlessly wail in our grief. You know, when these tragic things happen, you know, we pray as we should. We pray God's comfort as we should. I think a part of God's comfort is we understand that God is sovereign. And God's still in control. And we can trust in God, that's what it basically says, blessed be the name of the Lord, loose translation, good is the character of God. Yeah, God is taken away, God is good. You know, when God gives, we say, man, God is good. When you haven't been working, you finally got a job, God is good. When you've been ill and now you're well, boy, God is good. When's the last time we thought, I lost my job, God is good? Or test results came back poorly, God's still good. It doesn't change the character of God, that's where Job's at. Even in all of this, God's good. So connect your loss to the sovereignty and the character and the goodness of God. And it ends up that says, through all of this, Job didn't sin. He didn't blame God. You know, I, I, I think that if you want to get tipped off of God, you want to raise your fist, and you want to be angry, you know, I think God's okay with that for a little while. But don't, don't live there. You know, move past that. Or it'll consume you. And that's not where you want to be. So, someone at the end of the first service says, uh, I want to know, are you going you to stay with Job? Are you going to continue with Job? Because well, I, I want to know this. How, how come you didn't talk about Job's wife? You know what she said? Curse God and die. I mean, you know, is Job thinking, God, why didn't you take her? <laughs> so you guys are thinking that. Right? <laughs> and, and so God took others, but he left her behind to basically to harass him. And, and pretty much basically uh, call him a fool. You, you're going to worship God, really? You're, you're a fool. Crucify God. That's what you have to do. See, if you've done that, then Satan wins. And so when, when, when tragedy and, and heartache and loss and grief comes into your world, and it will, don't curse God. Be like Job. He is given, he is taken away, and he is God didn't, or Job didn't blame him. He didn't, he didn't understand the why. He didn't think that he needed an answer. Not at this point. Here, one day, if you're dead already, you will suffer a grief. Uh, whether it's linked to weather, or illness, an accident, or someone's evil intent, behind all of these things is the sovereignty of God and his watchful control. Nothing happens that doesn't pass through his hands. Nothing happens that we're allowed to have apart from his wisdom and permission. And I'll say this, for, for almost all that we'll never know why, but we'll know who, and that's God. See, if you don't know who, you will demand to know why. But if you know who, you don't have to know why. You rest in Him. Some of you may know how to do it, how it, how it is. You see, so far He's good. 
He gets signed with God to the book. He demands a debate with God. He won't let go. At the end of the Job, uh, God says, uh, all right, I've had enough. You tell me, big guy. You think you're so smart? Where were you when? And uh, you, you instruct me. You tell me how this stuff works. And God goes at it for about a chapter. And what Job says? I am a man who speaks without knowledge. I shut my mouth. Even then, God didn't let up. We're about another two chapters. Shit. I just said it's blasted. Job understood. I don't have to know why. I just have to know who. And hopefully, we'll rest there as well. We'll rest in the sovereignty of our heaven. You join me in prayer, Lord. I'm not saying it's easy. It's not easy. This is some of the hardest, hardest stuff I've ever experienced. For as long as we know who, we don't have to know why. Maybe once in a while you'll tell us why, but we're not entitled to why. A lot of the why we wouldn't understand it anyway. Because your ways are so far beyond what we can understand. Our, our finite minds. So Lord, thank you in the midst of this that the world's not out of control. Satan's not doing whatever he wants, whenever he wants. He can only do what you allow him to do. Thank you for your goodness, even when life doesn't seem so good. We praise Thanksgiving, Christ's name.